Hello and welcome to the United on Wheels podcast. What is up? It's me, Paul Amadeus Lane. So happy to have you join me today on the show. We have an amazing show. Why? We're going to talk about employment, especially when it comes for us who are part of the disabled community. October is National Disability Employment Awareness Month. This is where some of us who are employed are able to tell our stories, tell our journey, in an effort to really inspire ones in our community who may not have thought about getting back in the workforce. There are some challenges, though, to getting in the workforce. There are different things that we have to deal with to overcome. That's why we are so happy here at United Spinal Association that there's resources out there that can get us out in the workforce. We're going to be joined by an individual today. He's going to talk about some of the things and the challenges that he had to deal with trying to get back in the workforce post-injury. You might have saw a story on our website. I'm talking about Leonard Mayberry. If you haven't had a chance to read this article, make sure you check it out. We'll try to put it in the show description with an easy link so that you can find out more information about Leonard's story, about his injury, and some of the challenges he has faced. That's why I invited him on the show today, so that we can get a chance to find out more about him and what he's up to and how our program at United Spinal Association, our Pathways to Employment, has assisted him. I am so happy to have with me right now my next guest. You have seen his article on our website at unitedspinal.org. We're talking about the great Leonard Mayberry. What's going on, Leonard? How you doing? Hey, how you doing? Glad to be with you. Hey, great to have you, Leonard. And First and foremost, you know, your article is touching a lot of people's lives uh, on our website, and it really gives us a face uh, with the struggles that we face uh, from the disabled community, especially just trying to get back to work and and all the other things that we have to deal with. So I'm glad that you stopped by uh, to have a have a chat with me this morning as we as we talk about it. Well, I'm definitely glad to be here. You know, anything that I can do or say that'll help somebody down the road. I mean, I know the struggle is real out there. It ain't no doubt about that. So, you know, yeah. if I can make somebody's road a little bit easier compared to the one that I went down, you know, I'm willing to do that. You know. Yeah, and, and Leonard, back in 2018, um, talk about how your life changed. I know, you, I know, I know you mentioned it in the article that's on the website, but you know, if you can share that with us briefly. Right. Well. It actually it was June the 30th, 2018. You know, I was, um, it was a normal Saturday morning. You know, I was doing what I normally do. I, actually, I was getting ready to go to California. And um, I, I was riding my motorcycle. I had went by my god brother's house. We were talking about the trip and stuff. And I was riding my motorcycle. And I was in the country. You know, I was on the country road. Not very many cars. Traffic wasn't heavy or nothing like that. And um, a lady, not paying attention, you know, looking at the cell phone, made a U-turn and turned into me. And so it, it was at that point that everything changed. You know, like I said, when I woke up that morning, I didn't have a problem in the world that I couldn't solve. And when I woke up nine days later out of a coma, I didn't have a problem in the world that I could solve. And, and that was just the beginning of the journey. I didn't even really know how bad I was injured until, you know, maybe three or four months after because I ended up staying in ICU uh, 30 days. I, w I wasn't in ICU, the regular ICU. I was in the ICU part where they didn't know if they, you were going to live or not. And I stayed in there like right at three weeks. And then they took me out of there and they put me in regular ICU for like a week and a half, you know. But the whole time that I was in the hospital, I stayed in ICU, you know. Wow. And and Leonard, being in ICU, what 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 were some of the things that that, that you had to like come to grips with? You know, when, when did you know that something something was different and life that you knew it would be kind of altered? Well, when I when I first woke up out of coma, because you have to realize when I had my accident, I was still very conscious. I was still moving. I was still walking. I actually was standing up at the accident site when the ambulance got there. So the ambulance driver asked me, he said, well, you know, can you can you get on the stretcher? Because I was standing up. I was like, yeah, that ain't no problem. So me not never being a person that really got sick or never got injured, you know, other than, you know, little minor stuff, 
I was like, well, I know I'm hurt, but I'm I'm not hurt that bad. I'll be all right, you know, in a month, you know, a month and a half or so at the most, I'm thinking. But uh, I wake up out of a coma, which I didn't know I was in a coma. So I wake up out of a coma and I open my eyes up and my brother's standing over me, but I can't talk because I got a tube in my, you know, I got tube going down my throat. And so my brother told me, he said, don't move, don't say nothing. Well, I couldn't talk, so it wasn't nothing I could say. And so he ran out and he got my mom and my mom came back in the room and my, my sister and everybody came back in the room with me. And so my mom told me, she said, whatever you do, don't don't try to spit that tool back because it's going to be hard if they have to put it back in. And so even still at that point in my mind, I was like, OK, this is just, you know, something that I'm going through, but it's still not that bad. It wasn't until probably like the the after the third major surgery that I had that. I realized I couldn't feel my legs. And so it, it was one morning, it was like on a Wednesday morning, about 10 o'clock in the morning. And uh, I asked my brother, I said, you know, what's wrong with my legs? Why I can't feel my legs? And so my brother looked at my mom and nobody said nothing, you know? So then the doctor walked in and so my mom said, well, I'm gonna let him explain it to you. And so that was the point when the doctor told me that, you know, my when you when you get hurt when you get seriously injured and your body goes through a lot of trauma and, and your body shifts into life-saving mode and so what it does is it quit pumping blood all over your body and starts pumping straight to your heart to keep you living and that's what my body did but it did it actually at the scene so the, it, the moment that i actually had the accident my body shifted into life-saving mode which i didn't know so the whole time I was at the scene, I was really just living off adrenaline. Wow. And so um, I did notice, though, when I got to the first hospital, they had gave me, like, they were giving me a lot of blood. You know, they they, they gave me the blood, and then they would come back in and give me another bag. And then they gave me, you know, two more bags of stuff. And I didn't know what that was. You know, I really didn't realize what it was until, like, a couple of weeks ago. I was doing my disability paperwork, and so I was reading it. You know, and that's when I realized that because I was bleeding internally and I was bleeding out so fast that I had bled out two two units of blood, which is two bags of blood, a bag of platelets, and a bag of something else. So I had four bags of fluid being pumped in me while we, while I was waiting on life flight. You know, and like I said, when I realized that I couldn't walk, you know, the doctor had he had told me he said because my body quit pumping blood all over and just started pumping straight to my heart the signal from your brain through your spinal cord to your extremities that signal got lost and so it's still lost i still can't walk so i started out as a t i was a t6 no i was a t2 t2 to t6 mm -hmm. complete and then i recovered back to an l3 incomplete you know oh, nice so now um i have I can feel, but I can't move, mm -hmm. you know? And so, uh, you know, it's, it's been a blessing to recover because I know a lot of people don't right. don't recover anything back, you know? Some don't recover anything back, some recover everything back. That's the reason why they say every spinal cord injury is different, you know? Yeah. I know some guys who are L3 incomplete that can walk, you know? And I'm looking at me and I'm saying, man, what's wrong with you, you know? I, I mean, come on, let, let's get it because the sooner we get it, the sooner we can get back. But yeah. you know, I'm three years down the road, and it's still, you know, it's still a, it's still a journey out there for me to travel. You know, now, I definitely hear you. Definitely, because me being a C6 um, quad, uh, you know, doctor said I was complete and incomplete, and it's you know, it's one of those things where you know we learn a lot about spinal injury. You know, we we become spinal injury experts. You know, right, right, to, right, definitely. And and after 28 years, you know, you know, there's some things that came back for me. And, right. and and it's always uh the body is amazing it heals yeah you know yeah. the healing process of the body you know it, yeah. it, it is awesome you know and one of the things i wanted to chat with you with too is like when you were in the hospital did were, were there social workers there that kind of prepared you to like what maybe your new normal would be talking about career paths or or anything you mind sharing it well when, when i when i was in the trauma unit i didn't get a lot of interaction with the social workers. The social workers didn't, what, what would happen because I was so, I was so, you know, they didn't know if I was going to live or not. I mean, I was a day-to-day -day 
cases. And, and even my, my surgeon told me, he said, you know, when I come in in the morning, I look down at your door to see if your chart there to make sure you didn't die overnight. He said, because if I look and see your chart, I know you're still here. But if I don't see your chart, I know you didn't make it through the night. So I was, I was like day to day. I mean, it was like I would have three days and it would seem like everything was going to be okay. And then the next four days, I'd be going back into surgery for something. And actually, when they when they did my initial surgery, when I came off of life, like when they initially cut me open, they left me open for two days, you know, because when they went in, you know, it was so much stuff wrong with me that the doctor didn't want to sew me up and then have to cut me back open. So he left me, you know, they they wrapped me up in gauze and stuff, but he didn't initially sew me back up until the next, you know, the next day. And so um, as far as with the social workers, though, you know, I would have a nurse every now and then that would come in, but but nobody never would say the thing that they told me all the time was we don't know. That that's the that's the one thing that stuck out to me that they I would ask the question with hey you know why why why, why my legs don't work well you know your body lost the signal when is it coming back but well, we don't know it could be today it could be tomorrow it could be six months from now it could be six years from now. You know, and I had real, real bad nerve pain because my, my nerve endings got, they were stuck so open, so sensitive. So you could just barely touch my leg. I mean, just barely touch it. And it would be, it, it would feel like you dropped a ton of bricks on it. It would hurt so bad. And so when they would try to put my Ted holes on, the, the pain would be so unbearable, man. It was like, man, just knock me out. If you got to do that, just, just knock me out because I can't take this pain like this, you know. But the interaction with the social workers at the at the hospital, at the trauma unit, it wasn't that good. I didn't really start dealing with social worker interaction. And it really wasn't social worker interaction. It was when I started going to outpatient therapy. Because what they did, they took me from the trauma unit and they put me in a skilled nursing facility. But because I still wasn't, you know, well enough or strong enough, it wasn't a lot that they could do with me because, like, when I would go to physical therapy at the skilled nursing facility, I could only go for like maybe 10 minutes because my blood pressure would drop so fast. And so I couldn't I couldn't do physical therapy because of the, the drop in the blood pressure. And so so the, mostly the first, I think three, right at three months, I didn't do nothing but just lay down. And I was so weak, you know, I couldn't even roll myself over in the bed. You know, I ended up, you know, when I did come home from the skilled nursing facility, I, I went from the trauma unit to the skilled nursing facility. I stayed at the skilled nursing facility like three days. Then I caught a blood infection. So that put me back in the, in the hospital. I stayed in the hospital. I stayed at a uh, Methodist at this time for like 10 more days. Finally gets the, um, finally get the blood disease solved and then turn around and I go back to the skilled nursing facility. I stayed there about two weeks and then I ended up coming home. So my house wasn't, it wasn't handicap accessible. So, you know, you start making stuff up in your mind. You're saying, hey, this ain't going to work at all. You know, and then I didn't have, you know, at-home care, in-home care and stuff like that. So I called my mom, you know, and uh, thank God for my mom because I called my mom and I told her, I said, mom, I said, if you don't come and get me, I'm going to die. So I, I can't make it. You know, I'm not, I'm not going to get well here at all. And so my mom and dad came and got me that night, you know, and they brought me home, you know, brought me home to here because I'm at my mom's house now. And so they brought me here. But well, this house really wasn't handicapped accessible either. But the good thing was the door through the garage led straight to my mom's bedroom. So my mom actually let me move in her bedroom and she actually moved in the living room. And so at night, man, I would, you know, because my mom, you know, in her late 60s then, you know, I'm 48. So she was like, you know, she was like 65, 66, something like that at the time when this happened. And so I'm, I'm knowing in my mind, my mom sleeping on the couch ain't good, but she didn't gave me the bed. She wouldn't go upstairs and sleep because she wanted to stay downstairs to where she could hear me at night. Because at night I would try to turn myself over, but I wasn't strong enough. So I, I was so, so weak, you know, to where I couldn't even, I couldn't even roll over in the bed. And so she would hear me grunting at night and she would come in there, she would help me turn over. You know, and it was it was, it was bad for a long time, man. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna lie to you and tell you what, you know. And then by my mom 
sleeping downstairs and sleeping on the couch, her health started to deteriorate, you know, arthritis got in her shoulder and, you know, just different stuff like that. So the whole time I'm saying in my mind, I got to, I got to get well. I got to get, I got to do something because if I don't, it's going to affect her even more. And so when I was going to, to feel, when I was going to outpatient therapy, it was, it was a, you know, one of my therapists, she told me, she said, you really need to get into inpatient therapy. And she, she said, you should have came to inpatient therapy before you came here. And so I was like, I didn't, you know, didn't nobody tell us nothing about that. You know, I said, I, we, we never had nobody in our family to end up going through nothing like this. So we don't, you know, we don't know all that information. So it was, it was my, my actual physical therapist that made connections with the doctor. And that's actually how I got in inpatient therapy, you know. And before I could go to inpatient therapy, I ended up getting sick again. It's called an intestinal infection. So I had a C. drift infection. And um, what happened, I was staying here with my mom, but I wasn't eating. I couldn't eat. I wanted to eat, but I couldn't eat. And so my mom, she kept telling me, she was like, if you don't get well by Thursday, you can take it to the doctor. So I was trying to do everything by Thursday to get well because I didn't want to go to the doctor because I already knew. Chances are I go to the doctor, I'm going back to the hospital, and I ain't want to go back to the hospital because it was in and out of the hospital, in and out of the hospital, sick. I mean, I'm not talking about just regular sick. I'm talking about sick, sick. And so I go to my Thursday came, my mom came, so she said, you know, let's get, let me get you dressed because you're going to the doctor. So my mom gets me dressed, get me loaded in the car, go to the doctor. And uh, my doctor told me, she said, and I went to my primary care doctor. She said, Leonard, she said, you're so dehydrated. You need to go to the emergency room. She said, they're going to give you an IV. You're going to feel better. You know, she said, they're going to get some fluids in you. You know, you'll be you'll be feeling better. And so uh, we, go to the, we go to the emergency room. And uh, we sit in the emergency room about maybe five or six hours waiting to get seen. You know, that, that was excruciating pain just sitting in the emergency room. And so finally they called me to the back. I go in the back and uh, the, the nurse that came back there, she she took a little bit of blood. And so I asked, I said, well, you know, y'all gonna give me the IV and stuff and I'm gonna go home. And so she was like, we'll see, you know. And so I'm still thinking I'm going home because I don't want to stay at the hospital. No more. I've been in the hospital a long time and, and I ain't had no good experience in the hospital. So I don't want to stay at the hospital. And so... Uh, so I asked the nurse because I was sitting, I was still sitting in my chair. And so I had been setting up for so long and I was hurting. And so I said, well, can I, can I transfer to the, to the, the uh, gurney? Cause they had a gurney in there. And so she said, she said, nah, just, just stay in your chair. So when the nurse left out that room, man, I, it wasn't nobody in the room, but man, that was the first time that I transferred without a sliding board, you know, and I was scared of falling, but I was hurting so bad. Falling wasn't a bad option, you know? And so I transferred into that on that gurney and I got on that gurney. I, some kind of way I mustered up enough strength and I got on that gurney. So when the nurse came back in, I was laying down and she kind of looked at me like, how you get down there, you know, and, and stuff like that. And so she said, well, we ran some tests on your blood and we're going to admit you. And I, you know, when she said she was going to admit me, it was like, you know, just downfall again, you know, mm-hmm. because you, when you, when you're at home, you're thinking, okay, at least if I'm at home, I got a chance of getting better. And then when they say they're gonna get you in the hospital, it's like straight, straight down. You mm-hmm. know, it's like, man, this ain't this ain't gonna work. You know, I'm. I mean, what 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 what's really going on? What's the point in all this here? And so um, they ended up admitting me that night. They told me that I had the C drip infection, and so the infection was so bad in my body that the doctor actually told me if I wouldn't have came in when I did, it would have turned into cancer and it would have killed me within like a couple of weeks. And I, I was that close to death again, you know. And so, um, you know, that night when I was in, at the hospital because my mom was going to stay with me. And that, that's when that's when everything just really started clicking in my head. If you don't start fighting for your life, you're going to die, you know, because this thing is going to eat you up. You know, it's, it's killing you, literally. And so uh, that night my mom said, well, you know, I'll make my little, my little pallet over here, you know, and I'll be in here with you all night. And I told her, I said, no, nah, mom, I said, I'm, I'm at the point in this journey where I got to go the rest of the way by myself. I said, you know, you, you got to go home. I said, go home and get you some rest. She said, no, nah, I'm not, I'm not going to leave you in the hospital. I said, I'm at the hospital. You know, 
I said, I'm here with all the doctors and all the medicine. Well, I mean, you know, whatever's going to go wrong is going to go wrong anyway, but at least I'm already here. So I told her, I said, now nah, you go home and you get you some rest. I said, I'll be all right. And so when my mom left that night, the nurse came in. It was about like 12 o'clock at night because they always come late at night. They don't ever, they don't come in reasonable. When the nurses come in, it's every hour on the hour, but it seemed like at night, the hours be right next to each other. And so the nurse came in and, you know, she done the blood and, you know, they gave me the IVs and all that stuff. They started me on antibiotics. And so she wrote 197 on the on the whiteboard with all of the information. And I asked, I said, well, what's that 197 right there? Said, That's how much you weigh. I said, you crazy. I said, man, that, that, I ain't weighed that much since I was a senior in high school. I said, when I came in here, when I came in the hospital, when I had my accident, I was weighing 300 pounds and now. I've lost 100 pounds in less than 90 days. And so she said, yeah. And so that's when I realized, you know, through depression and all the medicine, and you know, I was on 50 different medications when I was in the hospital. And even when I got out, you know, I was on about 25, maybe 30 different medicines that I had to take every day, all day long, just to fight the pain, try to keep the infection down, try to keep the fever down, you know, all that kind of stuff. So I was on a lot of different medications. But some kind of way I had got depressed and didn't even know, you know, I mean, you know, not just really saying, but, you know, being, being a black man, I didn't ever know nothing about depression. You know, we we don't discover depression or mental health, you know, the way other people look at it and, and it's real. You know, I was depressed and didn't even know it. You know, I, I was saying, hey, look, if this is the way I got to live, you know, I would rather die. You know, that that's a sign of depression when you... When you don't, when you look at life and say it's not worth living no more, and you still living, that's depression to me. You know, that's, it's something wrong. You know, you need to find you somebody to talk to. But um, so when that nurse left out the room that night, you know, I, I started praying. I said, well, God, you know, maybe before I had said I wanted to die, but if you still want to keep me here. I'm willing to stay. You mm -hmm. know, and so you know, me and God, we had our talk that night, and uh, and next morning when the doctor came in at four o'clock. Because the, the doctor would come in at like four o'clock in the morning, the, the doctor that was over me. And so the they had this medicine that I had to take. But this medicine, they didn't keep it at the pharmacy. They, the, when the doctor would get there, he would call the pharmacy. They would make this medicine. And then a security guard, an armed security guard, would bring this medicine from wherever they made it at to the room. The room that I was in, it was, you know, I was like real contagious. So... You had to put on a gown, you had to put on gloves, you had to put on a mask and stuff even to come in the room. So the security guard would do all of that, put the gown on, put the gloves on, put the mask on, bring the medicine in the room, wash his hands, come in the room, and then the doctor would give me the medicine in a cup. I mean, it was, a, it was just a, a cup of medicine. It was a lip cup. The doctor would give me the medicine in the cup. I would drink the medicine get a cup back to the doctor and the doctor would get a cup back to the security guard and the, the security would leave. And so I asked the doctor, I said, man, what kind of medicine is that? It comes with a, with an armed guard. He say, this, this is some, some powerful stuff. You know, he said, we don't, we don't, they don't keep it in the pharmacy. They have to make it. He said, I have to call down there for them to make it. They make it and then they bring it to you. He said, that's the reason why they don't leave the cup. He said, they, they won't leave the cup. And so I told the doctor that morning, I said, say, man, I say, are you writing out all them prescriptions for all that, that stuff there? Can you write me out a prescription to help me eat? I there said, you go. I, I ain't been eating. And I know it's something you can give me to eat. And so the doctor, he did. He started laughing, though. He did, though. He, uh, he wrote the prescription out and gave me an uh, appetite stimulant. And he told me, he said, you can order anything you want to do off the menu. What would he tell me that for? <laughs> I took that first set of medicine. Man, I ate everything on the menu and I ate all day long. But that was the beginning of the turning point for me to really just pick up the wheels to fight the living, you know. Yeah. Because before then, you know, I, I was done, you know, because, I mean, I, I was 100% independent. I didn't depend on anybody for anything, no no nothing. You know, people say, hey, you need help? No, I, I got it, you know. And to go from being 100% independent to 100% dependent, that's a big shift. Even, even for the strongest of people, that's a big shift, you know? Yeah. And so, 
before before I had caught that intestinal infection, man, I had checked out. Because, you know, I, I had to wear a diaper and, you know, my mom had to change me. And, oh, mm -hmm. man, it, it, was, it was just so humiliating. You know, it, it was, you know, it was humiliating, but it, it's what had to be done, you know. When my sister would stay with me, you know, she would have to change me. And I would cry like a baby, you know. I sister, hear you. My sister would tell me, she'd say, you know, look, hey, I, I understand, but yeah. it's what we got to do right now. Man, I'd be mm -hmm. sitting there crying. Hey, she let me cry. She let yeah. me cry. And then she said, well, when you finish crying, I still got to, you know, I still got to change you, you know. Yeah. I mean, but that, you know, I mean, it, it, it was some hard time. You know, no, I totally, I, I totally, no, I totally get it, you know, because, you know, it's, you know, especially when you're an independent person and, right. and now, now you're dependent on others and, and things right. that we did personally for ourselves and, right. and everything to have help with it. It can, it can really do a number on us and, and I'm really good yeah. to see, see how you're able to, you know, to bring yourself back from that to, right. to, right. to fight. And, before your accident, I mean, you were you were busy doing a lot of things, you know, yeah, for work, yeah. and you had a lot of hobbies and things like that. And and did you have any help to to help you along the way to see that you can have different career paths? Because I, I know, I know that that you you know you you want to get back out there, you want to do certain yeah. things out there. What, what what has it been like to you know to try to get back out in that workforce? Well, well. I, I was a certified welder, so I was a iron worker. I was a field staff. Uh, uh, fabricator, metal fabricator. And I built a lot of high rise buildings downtown and stuff like that. Same same thing that I had said in my in my story. But um I worked for the city of Houston. So at first I really didn't worry about going back to work because they told me they would keep me. You know, they told me they said, Well hey look, you know, we know you hurt, but we'll find something for you to do, you know, until you get back on your feet because we know, you know, you're gonna get back on your feet. Well that's the story that companies tell you. But as stuff goes along, the, the plan changed. But they didn't tell me that the plan changed. And so they ended up medically separating me. You know, th at first they had called me and told me that we needed to do accommodations here. And I didn't I didn't know what accommodations here was. I thought, you know, they were going to come in and reassign me to a, maybe another facility or something like that or give me a different set of duties or something like that. And so when they first, when I went to the first accommodations here, they said that they couldn't accommodate me because I couldn't drive. And so I said, okay, so I knew that I could learn how to, I knew I could drive because when I was younger and I was like 18, I used to ride bulls. And so I had broke my right leg. And so when I had broke my leg, I had to drive with my left leg. And so I broke my leg one night at a rodeo. And so I was able to climb up in the, in the truck and uh when I climbed up in the when I climbed up in the truck and um my I was able to drive with my with my left leg. And so I knew that I could drive with my left leg, but the I wasn't licensed through the state to drive with my left leg. And so the problem came in was my license was, was really suspended, you know, because of my accident. And um I ended up going through vocational rehab. And I ended up going through a company called Stromat. But I still had both of my vehicles. I still had both of my trucks. And so while I was waiting to learn how to drive with Stromat, I started practicing driving myself in my truck. Because like I say, when, when I went to inpatient therapy, they taught me how you know to get in and out of a vehicle, how to transfer with the sliding board and different stuff like that. You know, So basically what they showed me at inpatient therapy was when you get to a situation, you got to be the person to figure your way out. You got to be able to figure it out the whole way through. You got to be able to plan it. You got to be able to plan if something goes wrong and you fall, you know, how you going to get back up, different stuff like that, because there may no, not be nobody around to help you out. So um, my truck is a tall truck. You know, I have a tall truck. And so the first time when I transferred with the sliding board, it was real hard. And then I realized, you know, trying to transfer up, on a sliding board, that's the hard way to do it. And so what I would do is I would stick my legs in, in on the floorboard, and then I would pull myself up to the side. <clears throat> and then I would take this hand and I would put it on my chair, take this hand, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> and I would grab the steering wheel and I was able to pull myself in. 
And so once I got in, I would take my right leg and I would stick it in the middle and I would drive with my left leg. And so I knew where a bunch of country roads and stuff like that was at. And so what I would do is I would always go to the country and practice how to drive. So when my when I went to Strowman, I actually told the instructor, I said, hey, look, I said, I've been practicing driving. He said, how you been practicing driving? You got hand controls? I said, nah, sir, I can drive with my left leg. He said, well, if you can drive with your left leg, I can get you licensed with the state to drive with your left leg. He said, but we still have to go through the same procedure. So I said, okay. So we did that. We went through the same procedure. We practiced for like two days. And then he told me, he said, man, you, you can go take the test tomorrow. He said, you know, you, you drive good enough to where you can go take the test. So within three days, I had my license back. You know, I went to the DPS office. I drove, you know, you drive like you drive normally. You know, some one of the DPS officers come out, they get in the vehicle with you. So we went driving, and when we got back, I parallel parked and everything. The lady opened up the door. I was like three inches from the curb. She said, man, you drive better with some people that have two legs. You know, and so uh, that's, <laughs> that's how I got my license back. So the, the reason why I went through that was because they had told me at first they couldn't accommodate because I couldn't drive. Mm -hmm. So when I went back to the accommodations here, I told them, I said, well, hey, look, y'all don't have to modify a vehicle for me. I can drive. There's no problem. When can I come back to work? So then it was, well, we still can't accommodate you because there's other job duties that you have that you can't do. So I was like, like what? So they said, well, you can't, you can't lift 40 pounds. So I was like, man. I said, but you know, can't y'all reassign me? I mean, give me something else to do to where I don't have to lift, you know, whatever it is that need to be lifted. I say, because I'm a field supervisor. I don't actually have to lift anything. That's why I have a crew with six people on it. You know, I actually set the jobs up, you know, and dispatch the crews to it. I don't physically go out there and do any of the work. So they were like, nah, you know, we can't do that. So we're going to go to the second stage of the, you know, process of the hearing. So this is what I did the second time. So they told me I couldn't lift the 40 pounds. So I got a bucket, a five-gallon bucket. Before the hearing started, the day of the hearing, I took a five-gallon bucket and four 10-pound weights to the hearing, to the office, because I knew what the office was going to be at. So I put the bucket inside the office, and I put the weights inside the bucket. So we get in the hearing. I go back outside, because the hearing, it was still like, it was 30 minutes before the hearing started. So I go back outside, I'm waiting on them. So, you know, I see all of them walk in. So they call me in, I go in now. So they say, well, you know, we're gonna have to proceed with the medical separation because, you know, you can't lift the 40 pounds. I said, well, I can't lift the 40 pounds. So they said, no, nah, you, you can't stand up, you can't walk. I say, but I can lift the 40 pounds though. So I scoot my wheelchair back, I get the bucket, I take the four 10 pound weights out and I set them on the table. I put the bucket on the floor. I put the four 10 pound weights in the bucket. I picked the bucket up and set it in my lap. So then they said, now nah, you, you have to be able to carry it. I said, no, that ain't what it says. I said, it says you have to be able to lift it, not carry it. I said, and I can't carry it. I said, because the bucket is sitting on my lap. I can roll it anywhere it need to go. It says 40 pounds. And so I said, you know, it just seemed like y'all really just trying to separate me. I said, because every time y'all say that I can't do something, I go and show you that I can do it. And then the next time you move the rung a little bit higher and make it harder for me to climb, I said, and then when I reach that rung, you come up with something else. I said, so it really just seemed like y'all just trying to separate from me. And they were like, no, nah, no, nah, no, nah, it's not that. But you know, we have to keep safety in mind, this, that, and another. So after that, we were supposed to, because I had started talking to my spinal cord injury doctor, and so I was telling him, I said, hey, look, I really want to go back to work. I say, I can do my job. I say, because I was a field supervisor. I'm not, you know, I don't have to weld no more. I don't have to, I don't have to physically do anything. I just have to supervise. You know, I say, I have to go to the field, make sure that the work is done the way it's supposed to be done. I say, but I have six people and I have a six man crew that actually does the work. I said, as far as the paperwork and stuff like that, I can do that myself. And so uh, he said, okay, he said, he said, because really what happened, the city sent over the paperwork, you know, about the job descriptions and stuff like that, you know, and he had to fill out the, it's called a medical questionnaire. So he fills out the medical questionnaire. 
So he told me, he said, the best thing to do is you need to have, um, it's like a, a field evaluation to where a person that understands disability actually goes with you to the job site and looks at, they actually shadow you for a day. You know, they go to your job, you know, they see what you have to do, what it requires, different stuff like that, to see if it's physically safe for you to go back to work and be able to do. And so um, I told him, I said, well, okay. So we go back to the third medical separation hearing. And so the the guy who actually was over, he was like, you know, I'm just ready to move forward with the separation. And so I said, well, my doctor says that I can come back to work. But y'all saying that I can't. I'm saying that I can, but y'all saying that I can't. I say it's a it's a field evaluation that could be done that'll say whether or not I can actually physically do the job. And so the lady at the, the hearing, she was like, Well, what is the cost? And so I wasn't just really looking at the paper. And so I said it would cost two hundred dollars. And so um, she said, Well, we're not gonna make a decision over a two hundred dollar cost. And so she said, we'll, we'll reschedule it. We'll reschedule the hearing till after you do the field evaluation. So she actually said for the city of Houston to pay for the evaluation, you know? And so the guy who was actually over the HR department that was handling the paperwork, when I sent the evaluation form in, because it was a company like Stromat, but it wasn't Stromat that was actually gonna do the evaluation. No, I take that back. It was Stromat that was going to do the evaluation. Stromat was going to do the field evaluation as well. And so when I sent the paperwork over, it was $200 an hour, and it was two hours. So it was going to cost $400. And so when I sent the paperwork to the guy who's over HR and over accommodations, he said that he had to send it to the city attorney because during the hearing, I said that it was going to cost $200, and it's actually... It's gonna cost four hundred dollars, and so he said that they couldn't they couldn't do it. But again, they had already made their mind that they were gonna medically separate. And so uh, when I went back to the to the civil service commission hearing, the actual guy that's over HR that was over accommodations, he had went with another field employee, and they had found this one bridge. We had this one bridge that that's in our our group in our uh, area that we, we maintain. And so this bridge has stairs on it. And so he said, you know, he's not gonna be able to climb up the stairs and, you know, he's not gonna be able to physically get on the bridge and inspect the damage and stuff like that. And so when we was in that hearing, I told him, I said, you know, the way that he does it and the way that I do it, would do it is two different ways. I said, because it's no need for me to go up the stairs for one. I said, because the damage is always on the outside of the bridge. The handrails get damaged. The physical inside of the bridge never gets damaged. It's just a guardrail. I say that can be seen from the outside. I say, and what I mean by the outside, I say, up underneath that bridge is a street. I say, because it's a railroad dock right there. I say, and I can drive up under that dock, up under that street where that railroad dock is, and I can see all the damage from the bottom. I say, as a matter of fact, I repaired that bridge before I got injured. I say, this is the reason why I know this. I say, because I had to set a lift on the bottom and bring the lift up to the outside of the bridge because you couldn't work on it from the top. And so uh, he was like, well, what about, you know, climbing down steep ditches? I said, I've never had to go down a steep ditch. He said, well, you have to go down and inspect the bridges. And so I told him, I said, look, I have all different, I said, I've been doing this position for eight years. I said, I've been a field supervisor for eight years. I've been with the city for nine years. I said, in the eight years that I've been in supervision, I came up with all different kind of ways to make the job easy. I said, I don't have to climb down no steep bank to set no post on the top of the bridge. I said, when all you have to do is measure from the center of the road over 20 feet and you'll have the outside of the bridge. And so the Civil Service Commission actually sided with the city and said that it was unsafe for me to come back to work, you know, and so they medically separated me. And so... When they medically separated me, that's when I found the pathways to employment. And the pathways to employment, it was man, it was a it was a blessing. I mean, because when you've done what you've done all your life, and then somebody tells you that you can't do it no more, even though you know you still can, you got to figure out something, you know. And like I say, this is when I was really in fight. You know, 
I had just got in fight mode. And I'm like, I'm not gonna let nobody throw me away. You know, I'm, I'm not no trash. You know, I'm, I'm gonna fight till the end. You know, whatever the end is, I deal with that when I get to it. But I'm not just gonna let nobody throw me away. And so what I did, I ended up talking to uh, Miss Barbara, and she was the one who told me about the ADA accommodation process. See, mm-hmm. I didn't when I was going through the ADA accommodation here. I didn't know nothing about the rules, the laws, or anything. And so it was it was uh Miss Barbara and Abby that first even told me that it was even laws that they were supposed to accommodate me because it was still a lot of my job duty that I could do. And they were supposed to accommodate me for the things that I couldn't do. And the only thing that I couldn't do was walk. But you know, 90% of my job when I was doing it, it was paperwork, you know, and it was supervision going to check on the crews, making sure that they had everything that they needed to get the job done with, you know, ordering the material, picking up the material. Like when I would go to the steel supply, I didn't have to load in the steel. The steel supply had a forklift there. They had workers there to load the steel. They would load the steel on the truck. I would strap it down, drive out to the job site. I got probably six guys on each job site, four to six guys. At the minimum, I got four guys out there. I didn't ever have to unload anything by hand, but they used that during the accommodation here, the separation here to medically separate me. But like I said, when I got the pathways to employment and I started going on the Zoom meeting, that's when I started finding out about the ADA laws. You know, I, I didn't even know you could be discriminated again because you had a disability. And oh, actually, yeah. you know, yeah. actually that's what they did, you know. Oh, yeah. And, and you know what's interesting too, Leonard, is you had uh, ones in positions of authority who right. were ruling on, ruling on your uh, on your case, you right. know, um, who didn't know this, and that and that's what's sad about it. You right. know what I mean? It's like they did not know that. And when you were telling me your story and everything, I was thinking they broke almost every ADA you know guideline right. in the in the way in the way that that, that they treated you. And right. Leonard, we only have about we only have about five more minutes, but I wanted okay. to spend spend the remaining of that time. Just talking about more about the the pathways to employment and and some of the things that 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 they they did in addition to letting you know you know how important it was to right. know the ADA law and things like that. If you can share that with us and 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 also what what we have to look forward to, um, any other line of work that you're going to go into because of the pathways to employment. Right, right. So um, like I said, they the pathways to employment taught me about you know the ADA laws, the disability discrimination and stuff like that. But then also, like I said, that Zoom meeting, you know, you, you can get a lot of other information on there. So like the virtual um, job fairs and stuff like that. I found out about all of that through the pathway through through employment, you know, going to the virtual job fairs, even even going to in-person interviews. Because like when you when you go to an interview, you don't have to let the employer know unless you want to that you have a disability. When you get to the interview, then they see you with the disability. But before you go to the interview, you don't have to let them know that part. You know, that's a choice of yours. You know, that was, one, that was another thing that I learned. And I did end up going to an interview and I didn't tell them that I was disabled. And then that's when I learned what the look is. And, you know, I, I share this with a lot of people on the Zoom meeting about the look. You know, when you're rolling in a wheelchair, when they see that wheelchair, that's all they see. They don't see that you can. They don't see that you came now, you know, for an opportunity. They just see you disabled. And it stops them. They don't even really yeah. look at your application. They don't look at your experience. They just look at your disability. Yeah, and, and we know that. you and I know about that look for another reason, yeah. too, don't we? Yeah. You know what? <laughs> yeah. For another reason, too. Yeah. No, go, ahead. go ahead, my friend. I didn't mean to cut you and off. So, uh, so, so I went to a couple of different interviews and I got to look to the point to where I said, you know what? Hey, my mind is still very strong. And instead of me trying to, you know, coax somebody, you know, or coerce somebody to give me an opportunity, to create an opportunity for myself. And so I came up with the idea to start an accessible transportation company. And so when I, when I shared that with, you know, Barbara and Abby, they got me in contact with, you know, um, actually, uh, James Wiseman from United Spinal, I think he's in New York or New Jersey, um, up that way. And then the ball just kept rolling. And the way that I came up with the idea to actually do it 
was I was in physical therapy one day and it was a lady there. She had been in physical therapy. She was there like an hour before me. She had a session before mine. I was there for an hour. And when I got ready to leave, she was still sitting there waiting. And so I started talking to her and I said, well, you know, what are you waiting on? She said, well, I'm waiting on Metro Lift to come and pick me up. And so I was like, how long have you been waiting? She said, well, like about two and a half. By that time, it was like two and a half hours. And she said, every time we call, they keep saying that they're sending somebody. And I was like, man, when you get through with therapy, you don't want to sit around no two and a half hours waiting on a ride home. You know, you want to go home. And so I had started driving, but she was in a power chair and I didn't have a way to put a power chair in my truck because I gave her a ride home that day if I could have done it. And so when I went to that interview with PTI, PTI was a transportation company and they transport, you know, people to the rail station, you know, the, the rail crew to the trains and you just drop them off. And so I said, well, I can start my own accessible transportation company and when you know, people need a ride, they have a disability, they don't have to sit around for two hours. They can call me and I'll come and pick them up and take them home, you know. And and that's where, that's where, actually the transportation company is called Green Mile Transport. That's the name mm-hmm. of Green, Green Mile Transport. And so, uh, you know, it, it's it's coming, you know, I'm, I'm working on it, you know, as we speak, you know. And and, and even, even with that, you know, uh, Pathways to Employment, you know, like I said, they they have a abundance of information, and when you come up with an idea, you know they just connect the dots along the way. They may not know everything. The person that you're talking to directly may not know everything, but they know somebody who know a little bit more, and that person knows somebody who know a little bit more. And so before you know it, you're in this this big old network. I'm I'm in a network with people way in Sacramento, California. You know I'm I'm actually going to Dallas the first weekend in December to meet up with a lady that I met at the Abilities Expo and she's going to sit down and, you know, talk to me about the business and different stuff like that. And, you know, give me some pointers and stuff like that. And, you know, we, we just met at the Abilities Expo. I've actually met her in person one time. I've talked to her on Zoom, you know, two or three times, you know, and she, and she's a member of, you know, United Spinal, you know, she has a spinal cord injury and stuff like that. But, you know, that's the, that's the thing about, the pathways to employment resources and the United Spinal resources, everyone helps one, you know, what you don't. And, and I didn't notice when I started doing it, but because I started doing it, I did notice that, you know, when I meet somebody, they have information that I didn't have. And when some, when I, once I meet somebody who, who's new into it, because I tell anybody now, when they, when we on that Zoom meeting, I tell them, I say, Hey, look, if your job say they're going to keep you, they're lying to you. They're not going to keep you. Yeah. I said, you have to realize you are you are a risk factor. You're a cost factor. If anything goes wrong, they're looking at they're going to be held liable. So they're not going to keep you. You know, I don't care what they tell you. They're going to they're gonna make it sound good. Because believe me, the city of Houston made it sound good. And I wasn't prepared for it. You know, had they told me, hey, look, you injured. We're not going to keep you. Okay, I'd start preparing for it. But That's actually, true. I was looking forward to getting back to work, to getting back to some sense of normalcy. Mm-hmm. And, and you know when that happens, it's like it, it keeps you, it keeps on kicking you down. Well, everybody's not strong enough at that point to get back up and start fighting. You know, just so happened I had made my mind up to fight before. But had I not, and had I still been in that depression stage, I don't know what I'd have done at that point because at that point I had lost it all. You know, no, I totally, I totally get it, and we so we are so glad that. That, that, that you decided, you know, to, to fight. Yeah. And the one thing I love about our community is that if we reach one, we teach one. And yeah. Yeah. we have we have great resources. We have a great organization behind us, United Spinal uh, right. Association, and great stories right. like yours with the path way to employment is, is really, really awesome. And and I tell you what, we're going to have you back on again. We're going to talk about okay. green the Green Mile Transportation, you know, as you continue to grow and yeah. everything. But, but really... Yeah. But really uh, awesome chatting with you, finding more about in depth about your about your journey, you know, right. your story, and then and just how how helpful, you know, yeah. the resources that we have at United Spinal uh, Association is really impacting lives. And and, and Leonard, um, you know, if you have a social media you want to plug out there so people can connect with you, you know, go right ahead and do it right now. Well, I'm on Facebook. I'm on Facebook under Leonard Mayberry. Um, also. My photography business 
because I do digital photography as well. I just started my social social media page. It's under uh, Green Green Mile Photography. Um, I'm Green Mile underscore photography on Instagram. So right. I, just, I just started posting pictures and stuff like that on there. But that's what I do. You know, I'm, I'm a digital photographer. I'm an iron worker. But I, but above all that, there, I'm a fighter. Right, and yeah, and fighter. and you you're not a cowboy fan, right? No, no. All right, good, good, because right. you, you and I would have problems if you were. So we all, <laughs> so we all good. But but hey, look forward to chatting with you real soon, uh, Leonard. Definitely, and find, definitely. Finding out how you going going on with the process. All right. All righty. Once again, a huge shout out to Leonard Mayberry. Love chatting with him about his story, about the things that he's doing now, being self employed. Have you ever thought about that and how our pathways to employment resource can help you do just so? Well, before I go, let's take a look at our website, unitedspinal.org. Don't forget right now, if you go there, you'll see our 75th anniversary coming up, building an inclusive world for 75 years. Find out more about the organization. Find out more about the resources. Go there and check it out. Until next time, folks. Please take care and stay well.